afternoon and welcome. I'm Dr. Melissa Pasquinelli. I'm the Associate Dean of Academic Affairs here in the College of Natural Resources. It is my pleasure to welcome you all here today. Thank you all for being here and a special welcome to Dr. Drew Lanham. Dean Floyd unfortunately had to be away due to a loss in his family. He regrets not being able to be here to attend today's lecture. Our thoughts are with him and his loved ones. Before we begin, I would like to first acknowledge that today is Yom Kippur. For those unfamiliar with this holiday, Yom Kippur represents the holiest day of the Jew Jewish year and is a day of atonement, fasting, and prayer. For those who celebrate, I wish you a meaningful Yom Kippur. We recognize that many of our Jewish students, faculty, staff, and friends will not be able to join us today. We apologize for this oversight in the scheduling the, this event and will strive to improve our planning in the future for the benefit of all of our community. Dr. Lanham has graciously allowed us to record this lecture. We will be distributing this link to the recording following the event to ensure our broader community has access and can enjoy today's lecture. We are honored to host this event each year and to bring distinguished speakers like Dr. Lanham to campus. Dean Floyd wanted me to express that we, he would have been extremely honored to welcome Dr. Lanham because he's known Dr. Lanham since he was an undergrad at Clemson where they both studied. Dr. Lanham, he's very proud of you and the remarkable rise in the field as a scholar and a scientist, as a celebrated author and a thought leader. And I just learned he's also an artist, so I look forward to, I hope you tell us more about that too. This annual Barcolo Lecture is a key opportunity for the College of Natural Resources to gather students, community members, and alumni around important topics in natural resources, conservation, and ecology. Not only does it give our students the opportunity to connect with leading experts in the field, it also fulfills a vital part of our mission to foster dialogue and collaboration that solves urgent challenges at the intersection of the environment, economy, and society. The Barcolo Lecture is important to the Fisheries, Wildlife, and Conservation Biology Program in particular because it strengthens the cross-college relationships that are at the core of this interdisciplinary program. I would like to say a special thank you to Joanna and Donald Can, who support this lecture each year in honor of Joanna's parents, Frederick and Joan Barcolo. Dr. Frederick Barcolo was the former head of zoology and a professor in the School of Forestry. He spent 32 years on the faculty and was inducted as the first member of the North Carolina Wildlife Conservation Hall of Fame in recognition of his lifetime of dedicated service to wildlife conservation. We often take for granted that a university is a hub for collaboration and the sharing of knowledge. But donor support is essential to our ability to host special programming and bring out, bring out outstanding speakers such as Dr. Lanham to campus. Unfortunately, the CANs could not join us in person today. However, they are with us virtually. Wave to them. Uh, they're on the live stream. It is now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Chris Mormon, who's professor and associate head in our Department of Forestry and Environmental Resources. He will be sharing a few remarks on behalf of Joanna and Donald Can and introducing our speaker. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Mormon. Thanks, Melissa, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, so as Melissa mentioned, the 
uh, Fred and Joan Barkalo set up this uh, endowed um, annual lecture series to continue their legacy and support of the conservation community here at NC State University. This lecture has brought in some incredible names over the years, including Frank, Frank Belrose, Val Geist, Fred Guthrie, Stephen Kellert, Monica Turner, and the list goes on, going all the way back to 1980. As you also heard, Joanna Can and her husband Donald have continued the important support that allows this lecture to continue. Joanna could not be here, but I am honored to speak her words. So Joanna, hello, and Donald, I'm gonna do my best. So from Joanna, the day of the Barclow lecture is always special for me. Whether, whether in person or virtually, I have the pleasure of enjoying a renowned speaker and knowing that the vision of my parents had when they created the lecture continues to grow, reaching an ever-expanding audience. No one can imagine my excitement when I received the Save the Date announcement and learned that, learned that Dr. Lanham was confirmed as our speaker today. Known for being a candid advocate for the natural world, Dr. Lanham believes that it is our moral responsibility to forward this belief in new ways. Similarly, my father was fearless in advocating for an individual's right to a decent, healthy environment. His support for environmental protection rested in his strong belief that animals, forests, rivers, oceans, and soil are held in stewardship for future generations. The success of the Barcolo Distinguished Conservationist Lecture would not be possible without the efforts of a lot of individuals. However, there are a few I would like to thank, beginning with Dean Floyd, the Dean of the College of Natural Resources, who is with us in person today and always supported the Barclow Lecture. Chris Mormon, blah, 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 um, created, created a system that his graduate students, that the program graduate students research and then they select the Barclow speaker, which has been an important thing to have the grad students involved. This is a process that my father, who mentored generations of students, would applaud. Since 2008, when I first met Chris, he has also become a special friend, cheering via texting our favorite sports teams. <laughs> uh, go Ravens for Joanna. And identifying animals in photos I sent him, as my father did for so many years in Raleigh. Dr. Christian Pacifica, who several years ago ably assumed the planning and management responsibilities for the lecture, and has always kept me informed of the details throughout the year-long planning process. And then there's dear Phil Dorr. Anyone needs a Phil Dorr in their life, Phil came to Raleigh in 1973 to work with my father. Together, they were the core teachers in wildlife biology and management. In the 1980s, Phil, the fisheries and wildlife faculty numbered two dozen, but Phil was more than my father's professional friend. He was a family friend and continues to be so today. And then lastly, thank you to my special friend, Jennifer Veets, Director of, College of, Natural, the De Co Director of Development and College Relations. And to all who work on the Barclow Lecture in any way, a heartfelt thank you. So I want to specifically point out Krishna. Is Krishna here? Where is he? Oh, there he is right there, Krishna. And then um, the grad students, we had co-leaders of the team, uh, Makai Carver. Makai here, raise your hand. Maybe she's virtual. And then Eric Tightsworth. And then Lauren Farr played a real, really critical role in also making this happen. So now is my pleasure to introduce uh, today's speaker, Dr. J. Drew Lanham. Dr. Lanham is an alumni distinguished professor of wildlife ecology and master teacher at Clemson University. A native of Edgefield, South Carolina, Dr. Lanham is the author of The Home Place, Memoirs of a Colored Man's Love Affair with Nature, which received the Reed Award from the Southern Environmental Law Center and the Southern Book Prize, and was a finalist for the John Burroughs Medal Award. Most recently, he is the author of Sparrow Envy, Field Guide to Birds and Lesser Beasts, Drew is a birder, naturalist, and hunter conservationist who has published essays and poetry in publications including Orion, Audubon, Flycatcher, and Wilderness, and in several anthologies including The Colors of Nature, State of the Heart, Bartram's Living Legacy, and Carolina Writers at Home. Dr. Drew Lanham is the 2022 MacArthur Fellow. I want to finish on a personal note. Drew served on my PhD committee and played a critical role as a mentor while I was a graduate student. He helped me grow academically with thoughts about disturbance ecology and wildlife conservation. We spent many hours birding in the field talking about patch size, songbird ecology, forest management, you remember those days, and sometimes just about football. Um, Please join me in welcoming Dr. Drew Lanham to NC State University for the 2023 Fred and Joan Barcolo Distinguished Conservationist Lecture.
thank you. Thank you, Chris. It's great to be here with you this, this afternoon and in sort of this full circle kind of way and, um, and being extra careful not to have too many tiger paws or <laughs> burnt orange and northwest purple showing. But understanding that we, we share really kind of a common lineage and, and maybe more than a common lineage, some sort of shared aspiration, some, some hope, really, in, in these times. And so I'm honored to be here, Chris. So honored to, to see new friends, Maju and Lauren, and to meet people like Phil, um, who I've, I've known, I think, for a very long time. I know I'm going to miss names, but just grateful, really, to be in this space after, after all of these years. And I'm reminded <laughs> just how many years it's been as, as former students move into, into, into these leadership roles. And it's almost as if, in some ways, time has stopped but at the same time it has gone on in, in this very real but pleasant way as well. I wanna spend my time today telling a story, really, and it's a shared story, and it's, it's the story of, of all of us. It's, it's a, a story, really, of, again, sort of, some common beginnings and some uncommon beginnings, some kind beginnings and unkind beginnings. But then to wind that story in a way that hopefully brings us from often points of divergence into points of convergence. I will tell you that today, <laughs> um, the only p-values will be of, of passion. And so the data set you see rolling behind me here is, uh, is really first person data. And these are all photographs that I've taken over time um, of places, the, the grasshopper sparrow that you, that you see there now, I think. Um, there will be a test on all of these species. <laughs> afterwards. But the ornithologist, all we have to say is grass and grass-like is all we have to say. Once upon a time, that's how we start our story, once upon a time, the first people of the first nations saw first this land and the abundance that fed, that clothed, that housed, and inspired them. This was a land overflowing with wildness, with mast and wild honey, and it was good. No, the land was not perfect, because the first people were users too, but in a different way, and it was good. But then the ships came, and what had been plentifully imperfect began to dwindle. And the good began to dwindle, too. De Soto and his conquistadors began the plundering and the dwindling that would go unchecked even until now. The explorers like Catesby, Bartram, Lewis, and Clark they saw this abundance and were yet amazed even in its waning, and they wrote about it. They painted it. They sometimes struggled for the words to even describe it. Imagine this. Rivers choked with runs of eel and shad so thick as one might imagine walking across them. 
Skies darkened with flocks of birds that broke the branches from mighty oaks. Herds of ungulates taking days to pass a single point. Prairie dog towns encompassing hundreds of square miles closer to home than you would think. Condors soaring, ferrets scurrying, forests dark and so deep with monstrous skyscraping trees, marshes and grasslands with no end. And there were immigrant bird artists. One, a neurotic, bankrupt Scotsman wannabe poet named Alexander Wilson, tried. And there was this arrogant, self-absorbed, biracial, Franco-Haitian named John James Audubon, who painted the wonders of the waning plentiful abundance, bird by bird. Through their eyes, the world began to see the natural wonders of this place. And yes, it was still good in places, even as it was getting worse in places. And so when one studies this once upon a time story, one also reflects upon the genesis and evolution of our profession. From the abundant plenty through manifest destiny through decades of wanton wastes to spiraling rates of extinction to some reckoning by Thoreau, by Muir, by George Bird Grinnell, by the nameless bird-loving women who contemplated their convictions for conservation even as they demanded suffrage, and Theodore Roosevelt and Gifford Pinchot and George Washington Carver and Rosalie Edge and Aldo Leopold, Ding Darling, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, Sigurd Olson, Rachel, E.O. Wilson, Jane Goodall, Majora Carter, Greta Thunberg, and those yet to be named, maybe your name among them. These people have all had a vision, some courage, some courage, but resolve to change things, the grit to do better even in the worst of times to combat the market gunners and punt boats, to stem the deadly tide of predatory plume hunters, shooting long-legged waders off the nest by the millions for fashion's sake. Bison exterminated by technology for greed, and yes, racist policy. Rail and repeating rifle took men west who slaughtered the herds, to push Lakota, to push Crow, Assiniboine, Blackfoot, all out. Carcasses littering the ground with only the tongues removed and the remainder left on the prairies to rot. And so the Great Plains fell silent, empty, no chickens danced, no elk bugled, no wolves howled, the pronghorns slowed grizzlies ghosted, the Great Plains nations, all in the way of westward expansion, all impeding progress. Back east and south, land worked by enslaved, was initially given over to freedmen and then taken back and what was left was then stolen by tax lien and institutionalized trickery. And so those who often worked the soil and tried in vain to pay, to pay deed by sweat and toil, they failed. My ancestors, the 40 acres and the mule became promises broken. These lands became hunting plantations. In the wake of privilege, Bob White quail, covey rise, dogs running, swamp deer, and ducks on slave-built rice marsh, it was, and still is in many ways, a world built for the pleasure of some. And still, 
a broken black diaspora was dispossessed of connection to nature on lands they built. And the wild things, and the wild things, the wild things suffered all along, killed and plundered until billions were reduced to fewer and fewer. And there were names for some of these things because the once uncountable became one. Martha, the passenger pigeon, Incas, the Carolina parakeet, the last of their kind dying alone in the same aviary, Martha, 1914, Incas, 1918. Booming Ben, the last heath hen, boomed his last on a Martha's vineyard dune and met an inglorious end in the mouth of a feral cat. Now, where have we heard that story? Think of this, a she-wolf's fierce green fire faded in New Mexico because no one had their heart's ears ready to hear the mountain cry for its life. Swamps were drained and busted, soil eroded, the droughty dust bowl erupted, the rich black Chernozum was plowed under to blow dust from Oklahoma and Kansas into the Capitol's doorstep. Did you know that? And that was when they believed it was happening, by the way, when the dust storms reached the Capitol's doorstep. Old growth cut and devastated, the great Lord God bird, double rap knock and Kent call in the den of ravenous saw and steam engine forestry run amuck goes quiet. And Adam splits and collides. In that moment, we are all newly threatened with oblivion. Poison and pesticides are sprayed everywhere carelessly for a better bug-free life, but this just becomes death biomagnifying death. A courageous and quiet heroine named Rachel says, think, but feel more. We try as Martin marches for equal rights for everyone, there is no clean water to drink in Flint, still. Toxic flumes choke the poor and people of color more, still. The Amazon still burns. Plastic floats to make deadly new islands of Anthropocene trash, and the world is warming up. Polar bears are drowning and poor children in Appalachia cannot breathe. Coal ain't never been clean and will not be. And yes, it's happening, even if you say it's not. History is past, many would say. Faulkner said it wasn't. What we knew and saw before, we see and live now. And as we pay attention, the old adage says, those who forget their history are doomed to repeat it. Contrary to what you've heard, I'd like to introduce extinction as a verb. It is the final action word, conjugated once and for all. Action word, conservation, to conserve. This, my friends, is at the root of who we are. This is our function. This is our genesis. This is our revival. And so for all of this devastation, for all of this desecration that's gone on, there has been good. I would like to offer that is why you are here. You've heard all of these stories, I hope. Weave into the long but loosely woven history of wrongs against the wild, the right that we've somehow found. The moral act that I sometimes like to move to a moral act. That's what we need now. The Lacey Act, Pelican Island, a hunter conservationist naturalist president sitting lame duck and carving out swaths of national forest before a sleeping Congress could act. 
the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, Bankhead Jones Farm Tenant Act. Everyone knows what that is. The Civilian Conservation Corps, the Duck Stamp, Pittman Robertson, Dingle Johnson, the Endangered Species Act and CITES, the Clean Water and Clean Air Acts, the Farm Bill, the Paris Accord, a Sand County Almanac and Silent Spring and Biophilia, Guns, Germs, and Steel, Wildlife in America, the Bible, the Quran, the Torah, scrolls and etchings on hides and rocks and stories and caves and around fire circles, passed down for ages. Holy words, sacred words, directives to care for our world, but also for each other. I've even imagined the ghosts of Rachel Carson and Martin Luther talking environmental justice and land health over coffee, shade grown, of course, and bird friendly. Consider all of this, the good, the ugly, the bad. Imagine what it took, then imagine harder at what it will take going forward. That, after all, is why we are here. What was, what is, what we change from worse to better, we have to consider the historical context. That can't be writ rewritten, whitewashed over. How did we save anything at all? It is a bit of a miracle that there's anything left, but where are we now in that undulating sign function of discovery, of ex exploitation, extinction, of recovery? What grade, I ask, would you give us on the most recent tests to inform, to inspire, to make good from bad, to make better best, to actually conserve, to take action rather than be still. Have we advanced? Have we backslid? Or are we just barely holding ground? What do we do? That ominous music does not forbade, <laughs> well, forebode well for us, right? Something is coming. <laughs> what, my fellow conservation colleagues, then, do we do as the bad marches for us? So here we are. <clears throat> here we are, North Carolina State University. Here I am, there I am at Clemson University, there others are at Virginia Tech, at the University of Georgia, at any land grant that you can think of. And what we have is a moral responsibility to move forward. And that moral responsibility is in part built on a debt that we owe for how we even came to be as land-grant universities in the first place. You all know that story. So we're assembled. I'm gonna call us an association of nature nurturers. That's who we are. You're paying the dues. I'm not gonna ask you for membership. Here you are, you've already claimed that. We are tasked with heavy responsibilities to learn, to teach, to connect, to conserve. Conservation has at its core the mission. Here's the mission for conservation for any of you. And I want hands raised for those who've heard it in a class, on the street, at a professional meeting, I don't know, in the last six months. Love, you hear that at TWS? And care. <laughs> now, somebody can challenge that stat. Somebody can challenge the quality of the research but I would argue that what brought you here in the first place, maybe, was just this curiosity. 
you know, I like to think about these, these, these memories. I like to remember what stopped me as a kid. Maybe it was the song of some bird that I couldn't recognize. Maybe it was Bob White quail flushing from the blackberry thicket where I could also pick enough blackberries for a cobbler that night, but also could rely on those birds to be there every day. And when they exploded from that thicket, <clears throat> I could count on that reassembly call. <clears throat> but also, maybe it was just the the commas in that puddle. The commas in the puddle? What do you mean, the commas in the puddle? You know what? You became a noticer when you stopped for a moment at that puddle, and those commas moved these little black dots with tails that weren't there the day before, and suddenly you paused. These were the commas in your life. And at that point, you were a noticer. And an aspiring naturalist, because you did what? You wondered what they were. And maybe you counted, right? Now, was that a census or a survey? <laughs> you made the decision. You said, well, there are a lot of tadpoles. There are a lot of these little black things. Or maybe you counted the exact amount. And then you went home, and because at that point in time they appeared magically, you were believing in spontaneous generation, right? You were thinking, oh my God, these things came out of nowhere. And then you went, and maybe you asked mama and daddy or auntie or granny or a friend, and all of a sudden you got the lesson, not from birds and bees. Suddenly, suddenly, you're a scientist. Because then your curiosity leads you to, well, these commas, these things that gave me pause at the puddle that I counted, that came from not one thing, but two things in union. I wonder, these things are going to change. Maybe I'm going to go, maybe I take a couple and put them in a jar, put them in an aquarium, and I watch them and they develop legs and you learn about metamorphosis. But in the meantime, you've gone back and you've noticed that the puddle is drying around the margins. You've noticed a tire track close to that puddle and you become concerned about those beings that you've paused for. And you know what you are in that moment of care and concern for some being other than your human self? You're a conservationist. Care and concern enough to stop, to loiter, to look. And so here we are. This mission to love and care means that what we do here in the four walls, learning about stewarding some habitat, maybe it's grasslands or wetlands or forests, shorelines, city parks, greenways, Maybe it's in our work in sustainably managing and nurturing, conserving wildlife from white-tailed deer to black and white warblers to humpback whales to bull trout to grizzly bears to Gila monsters and all the wild places and wild things we can think of, making sure that where necessary, the human hand is minimized, but then to understanding that reconnecting humans to nature is a necessity. We are not separate from it, but part of it. To be sure, our hands are already in it and our feet too, but how do we handle it more gently? How do we not squeeze the life out of what we hold in our hands? How do we tread more tenderly? Yes, conservation's mission is to care. We have to teach this, we have to investigate this, we have to enforce it at times. We must think of it, but we must also communicate it. We have to feel this care, but we also have to be this care. So I stand in front of people and I talk about this love and care and depending on the audience, you can almost hear the eye rolls. 
right? They click. Because how are you going to measure that? How are you going to legislate that? How does that happen? And so I ask, do we really know what it means to be these stewards? Does it really impact us on a day-to-day -day basis going back and forth to class that what you are being tasked with is a moral responsibility? How many people get that? That we're teaching about something more than the count. That if we're watching some bird only with the intent of getting it on our e-bird list and if it disappears from the face of the earth, we could not care less. That our watching is worthless. And so we have to have an indomitable grit. We have to have a psychosociological carrying capacity psychosociological carrying capacity to do better than we have done as we descend into some unknowable conservation burrow in this new age. We ain't seen it as bad as it's going to get yet. Right? Chris and I are just talking about flamingos being far flung from their homes and everybody's gone crazy to see a flamingo, right? In these places. Thing is, Ways being made for flamingos, you know that. <laughs> That's likely to be a range expansion. Truly. Now, ask brook trout about that, Brad. Brook trout have a different opinion of things. You got to wet a fly to understand that. You got to walk in some different spaces to understand that. What's the cost being incurred for us not caring? What's the cost being incurred for progress being the watchword? What will this net us in the end? And so I'm hopeful in doing what I do because I believe we understand, you understand what's at stake. That's why you are here. That's why you pay your hard earned money or someone pays hard-earned money for you to sit in a seat, for you to show up every day, for you to understand that what you're doing isn't just about a grade, that it's about matters of the heart. We know that there is no get-rich-quick scheme in this line of work. I'll tell you now, if you thought it was, someone lied to you. There is only the long-term forever remembered become enriched with each sunrise and sunset investment. Our stocks rise with each dawn chorus of weary transgulf migrants fallen into our backyards. With each bull elk's mountain meadow bellow echoed off of canyon walls. We can smell it in the fall woods where the buck just rubbed. Our investment is amortized in each shed or eel's epic return to spawn in a rushing natal stream where it was once an egg. Our savings are compounded with each sunset glowing red as fire on salt marsh compounded with each loggerhead sea turtle's eons old crawl from surf to shore. Interest accrues with every witness to the miracles of migration and, adapta and adaptation, and in those dividends we cash in treasures beyond any currency's value. The question is, how do we keep this value safe? How do we reclaim what's been lost and compound the good that's been gained? This will require us to not only do the best science we can do, it will require doing more than we ever have in the face of decreased funding and those who would deny the truth. 
This will require us to do more than settle for policies already written. It will require us to draft new ones. It will require a more zealous enforcement beyond slaps on the wrists for crimes against wildness and humanity. It will require us to fish for hope where there is no structure, to hunt for it where there seems to be none. This will demand that we stand on this bedrock of tradition, imperfect as some of it may be. But we also have to be bold enough to recognize when we must build and stand on new ground. This means breaking down global convention that the scientists and professionals consume to render pieces small enough that it becomes palatable to the masses who vote by township and crossroad. Wouldn't it be great if every voter was also an associate certified wildlife biologist? Maybe not. <laughs> That's an assumption there, right? This means that this work can no longer be a closed carton of homogenized good old boy effort. There is an expiration date of demographically colored change coming due and that right soon, trust me. It's time to break the complacency boxes we've been comfortable in. It's time to shatter the glass ceilings over some of our heads. It's time to integrate the leadership and turn over the board tables to open up the clubs for non-restricted access and mix things up. Let's inclusively maximize our own diversity as we so eagerly seek it out in our field work. This means that every last one of us, educators, ornithologists, ecologists, mammologists, mycologists, herpetologists, biologists, ichthyologists, the policy wonks, the law enforcers, the modelers, and even the bureaucrats, all must become activists towards a single cause. Hunters and birders must let off on the full draw and put the high-powered binoculars down to recognize common quarry. I'm really sick of environmentalism being waged against conservation and vice versa. Happens every day. I can stop you dead in your tracks with a wind turbine. How many people in here want clean energy? Raise your hands, everyone. Well, where do you want it? Right? And it stops us dead. And then we refuse to talk to one another. And then we make enemies of each other, even though the goal is a common one. We must recognize that none of us are non-consumers. Whether we watch or walk or shoot or stalk, we leave trails behind us and take more from the land than we give. And so this means we must see our roles and responsibilities in some new light. We must all recognize that the human dimension is the hardest to manage or predictively model. We must realize that our fates as homo sapiens, the so-called knowing ape, and that of wild beings are inextricably linked we are all in this together. Same air, same water, same soil, same earth, same breath. Same breath. Same fate. And so I propose that we must consider our place not just as wildlife or conservation or environmental professionals, but as social change agents. Oh, wow. Really? You're going to tell me now that I have to be an activist. Yes. If you're in conservation without this idea that you got to do a damn thing to get a damn thing done, then you need to do something else. You paused at the puddle. You counted. You cared. What happened? What happened? So the next time someone discounts what you do, <laughs> right? Okay, so at Clemson, Chris knows this. Brad knows it. <laughs> um, ag and natural resources, we're kind of those people over on the other side. 
we're funded differently, right? We're, we're counted in sort of a different way. And, um, and, and it's something that has bothered me for quite a while because when I think about land-grant mission, at least as in that, in that good side of it and who it is that we should be, you know, we really ought to be screaming at the, at the top of our voices that the jobs we do are critical. That's this moral imperative that I'm talking about. And so I want you to consider, again, from that comma in the puddle, from that polywog, from that tadpole, from their point of view, imagine. Now, someone's going to say, oh, God, here he goes. He's anthropomorphizing. Uh, you can't prove to me what a tadpole is not thinking. <laughs> you can't. And so at some point, to look up, and there's, I don't know, God looking down. And things are drying up, and the cars are coming through the puddles. Or maybe you've got some friend, remember that friend who instead of pausing to look and count, who would stomp through the puddle? You, you all know them, and you know some of them now. <laughs> you know some of them now. What's the activist work? Go around. Go around. What's the educator's work? Can you see those tiny legs? This is, this is going to be a frog. If they've got clean water, it means good things for them and it means good things for us. And so... Yeah, there are some of us who can live without wild things, but I can't. And I hope that you can't. And I hope that you take this opportunity while you are here at this university, at this institution, to bolster that activist attitude as a conservationist, to do more than watch, to do more than worry, but to work. I roll my sleeves up. <laughs> in part because that means it's time to go to work, right? It's time to get our hands dirty. But more than that, it's time to make our hearts beat harder. It's time for us to come together in something in a way that makes a difference. And so when you take the time to do what you do, to do this work, you are making a difference. And in making that difference, you become a part of that once upon a time. You become that next step that someone then writes about, that someone sees, that someone says, you know, yeah, I, I, I saw them. I heard them. I heard them. That's who we are. That's our story. I'm proud to be a part of it with you. I, I, I cannot tell you the, the honor um, that I have in you know, this is very different than standing up in front of someone, uh, of a group of people, and, um, you know, you always have those one or two who you know are going to come at your stats. They're going to come at it. They're going to come at it. Um, and I ask you to come at my stats, right? This is my data set. This is my data set. And I will tell you that is that I've had to transform it, right? But more than that, it's transformed me. Because it ain't normal. <laughs> and I hope that we all run away from that. So I'm grateful for your time. I'm grateful for your patience. But mostly I'm grateful for your passion. And having me here. And I will tell you. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say this. Because it's something I've wanted to say for a while. Um, you know. Be, being in school with Chris, you know, being at an institution with him, you watch people. You watch people. You not only watch who they are and how they are, but you watch who they become and what they do in their lives. And I'm going to say this in the kind way, thank you for being different than your cohort. 
That's all I'm going to say. Because I can look in this room and I can see a difference in this place. I can see a difference in this place. And he knows what I mean. But, uh, you know, I, I, I always said my grandmother, man, my grandmother was, she was a, a fundamentalist mystic. <laughs> oh, we, I, yeah. Uh, but she would always say, you know, you, you know, you will know people by the works that they do. And being here today, um, and Myron, Myron and I talk. Myron's not just someone I knew. Myron's also a frat brother of mine. Um, <laughs> So I've, I've known uh, Dean Floyd for a while, um, but I know that he dearly loves this place and he speaks well of the program and what goes on here. Not, no place is ever perfect, but I appreciate you being a part of this, Chris. Thank you. And thank you all for having me here. Happy to take any questions and look forward to uh, communing later on. Thank you. Questions? And, I, and, and again. So I'll bring the mic around when you just raise your hand when you have a question. I promise 100% response rate. It could be that. Is it not a question so much as looking for some more uh, wisdom ideas on this environmentalism versus conservation issue? Um, thinking about it mainly as an educator, what do we, how do we need to educate, prepare? What do we need to bring to that? Um, to make progress. First of all, hyphenate yourselves. Uh, by that I mean do not sit in either camp apart from the other. You know, I, I think part of the problem is that we're so anxious to be pigeonholed. I mean, I mean we sort of taxonomize, <laughs> that's a new word, um, we, we sort of put ourselves into these places, right? And so I, I think it's important really that we consider who it is that we are. And, and that, um, that environmentalism, how is environmentalism different from conservation? I mean, that's not a question that I can necessarily answer, um, but, I, but I have for myself. And so I think it's important for students in the classroom um, to understand that there is that chasm that is created to create this tension between us. You know, I'm going to tell you, I, you know, I'm, I'm not a duck hunter. I sometimes eat duck, but I'll tell you what, birders, most birders could not pass the proficiency test that ethical waterfowlers can pass. Ducks on the, du ducks on the wing in, a, in, a, in fog and cold at 100 yards, and you, and you got to tell hen teal apart, and they do it. I've watched them. But all that many birders want to call duck hunters is bird killers, and they want to call a duck stamp a license to kill. How many people in here understand the formulation for wildlife funding in any state in Pittman-Robertson and hunting license sales? If you don't hunt, buy a license and rip it up. But I guarantee you, I guarantee you, when hunting license sales go down, funding for your state goes down. That's, and you may not like the North American model, well, damn it, change it. Birders pay a tax on binoculars. We've asked that several times. They won't do it. Won't do it. So there's that chasm that exists, right? And so all you got to do is look between hunters and non-hunters. That's one of the ways that we began to look at it. Um, and, I, you know, I love sitting on that rail. Pete Dunn. If you know who Pete Dunn is, the famous birder, Pete Dunn wrote a great piece about being caught coming out of the deer stand one day. <laughs> Have you read that, Chris? He was caught coming out of the deer stand, and he had to explain, he had to explain himself, right? Now, some people feel differently when they see a white tail taking a bird out of a mist net and eating it. <laughs> they do that, <laughs> right? Um, but I, but I, I say all that to say that sometimes we learn, need to learn to dwell in the gray, right? And, and if someone says, because I have you instantly, 
you know, one of the things I teach in policy when we talk about burden of proof, right? If the burden of proof lies with the conservationists, at least in our societies as it exists now, and somebody says, how much is the Noose River water dog worth? How much is one Noose River water dog worth? How much? I can pretty much tell you how much a white-tailed deer is worth. Can, I can tell you. So if you're on a stand, right, in a court of law, the ecologist in having to prove the worth of a living being seldom wins. And when we do, we then create contention about that living being such that people say, well, I'm just going to go out and cut down all my forests so I don't have to deal with red cockaded woodpeckers until something called safe harbor comes along, right? And then safe harbor gives options and it gives ways to think about the gray, sort of. So um, I think one of the ways to begin to break down some of these, the, the dissonance that's created between environmentalism, environmentalism and conservation is to begin to think about how we live our lives, sort of um, putting one another into camps putting one another into camps. Because some of the same people who love birds want to shoot brown-headed cowbirds out of their backyard. And to me, you're punishing evolution. Right? See, they put a soapbox up here, right? You can't see it. <laughs> this on. Bob Brown. Hi, Bob. Uh, I'm going to ask you a question you've probably been asked a thousand times through your career that People like Chris and I and heads of academia and state and federal agencies and even NGOs struggle with. If you look at our audience here, it's pretty gender diverse, not very ethnically diverse. What do we do about that? Um, great question. And I, you know, one of the things that I used to do is people used to say, well, how do we get more? Well, the first question I ever had like this was, uh, someone wants to know how many black birders I had made, and all I could all I could see was me like on a like on a on a you know a fresco touching. <laughs> uh, but I thought about that question, and I thought about a particular graduate student, and I thought about um, Dr. Keenan Adams, who Chris knows Keenan, um, who's with the Fish and Wildlife Service now well, Forest Service, um, special detail in Puerto Rico. But I remember uh, Keenan did his master's thesis um, initially on, um, on riparian zone, zone birds um, down in, in South Georgia, right? And so here I am, and you know, and Chris and I, we identify these birds. I mean, I, we've been doing it all of our lives. And so we're like, oh, you need to be able to identify at least 80 birds by sight and sound before you begin the field season. You know, and you bring these people in and you say, oh, you identify all these birds. Um, and when they said that, they were like, when they said, how many black birders have you created? Like there's, I'm being held to some standard of some metric, right? Um, but I, I bring Keenan up because I think about um, sort of our initial struggles in that project. And then I was like, wait a minute. You know, when as scientists, part of what we're doing when we're developing the question is to do what? Refine the question. You know, Dave Otis used to say, do you want to know a lot about a little or a little about a lot? That's the first statistical question that you got to ask. And so I began to think because I'm like, well, why, why do I have him learning all of trying to learn, struggling to learn all of these things when I can really sort of pare down this community, pick out some key species that maybe we need to learn and, and we went from there. So the point is that initially, here I was with my first black graduate student trying to make him me. Learn all these birds today like I did. You didn't grow up like I did. So I say that, Bob, is that we have to meet people where they are, right? I tell folks, because they're like, well, how can you get more black folks in the outdoors? We're there. It's just that maybe my catch and release is in a pan of grease. That's different. Go to the, go to the low country here or, and, and you see people fishing creeks, right? On a Friday, what are people fishing for? 
fun and food. Fun and food. For everybody, I, you know what? I grew up and know, okay, there was no slot limit on Hornethead Chubbs. I'm going to tell you that now. Um, <laughs> but it's, when we went fishing, it was the most fun I ever had. It was my exposure to a lot, and it was dinner on Friday night. If Mom and, didn't, and Daddy didn't stop at the fish market in Augusta, usseries. Um, so I think part of it is meeting people where they are and understanding that it, even though folks may not be watching birds like you think they're watching birds, your northern cardinal is their red bird. Your yellow-billed cuckoo is their rain crow. And they have connections. And so we, we've got to expand what it means to be out. Um, and I think we don't do a great job in our major of conservation of talking about food. We just don't. We don't talk about foods enough um, we don't talk about that initial connection. I can tell you that sitting, standing in, in front of some of the brightest kids from high schools, you know, we have a chance to talk to them at some of these camps. And one day, one kid, he was eating something in class he wasn't supposed to eat. I didn't care, really. But it was a chance. I said, okay, you're not supposed to be eating that in here. But if you can tell me where two of the ingredients from your candy bar came from, I'll buy everybody in here a candy bar for tomorrow. And he, he's just like, oh, I got this. I, uh, uh. So he got, I can't remember the first one, but he got to, to peanuts, right? And he was laughing. And he was like, everybody, write down your choice now because Doc is buying everybody candy. And he said, everybody knows these come from a peanut tree. <laughs> Do you know the statistics show that a significant number, I think it's eight-year-olds, think that bacon comes from a plant. That people don't know that if they eat meat, that it blinked at one point in time. So I think one of the ways that we think about inclusion um, and diversity is that we expand what conservation means, and that begins in the soil and the food that you eat. Um, and I'll tell you now, I don't know what's going on here, but a lot of places, including my own soil, Soil scientists are a rare breed. You guys, how the soil science, how soil science doing here? How many of you have had a soils course? Oh. That, that tells a story, right? I mean, at the base of everything. It's not dirt. Don't ever call it that. <laughs> it's the first thing you learn in a soils class. Um, but that's an important thing, and part of what we're where we're losing ground, we're losing ground through our farms. We're losing ground through. I mean, now there is a wonderful industry. All you got to do is, you know, there there are lots of farmers of color on TikTok. Oh yeah, now you sometimes wonder how they're getting a crop in, um, but I, I think part of again of inclusion and diversity is for us to diversify and to broaden the scope of what conservation is, for us to include farming, farming in the conversation, for us to include foods in the conversation, for soils to be a part of our curriculum. What, how many hours you have to complete here now? 120 undergrad? It's 120? Well, remember what it used to be. And then promises were made that you would get out in four years exactly to the day. And so all of those credits that you used to take that would enhance you in these ways, you don't have them now. How's entomology doing here? Pretty good. Good. <laughs> it ain't at Clemson. Right? So again, I say that not to disparage my university, but you know, I, I think at, at times what we do is we lose vision for what um, you know, our, our mission is, especially on that, on, on the side of the street, figuratively speaking, where we are. And so I think we have to, if we're going to be inclusive, that we reach sort of across the aisle in ways that says to people, you know, I mean, literally, wildlife now is rocket science, right? I mean, people are watching critters from space, they're doing remote sensing, but there's also this huge human element does anybody in here in the profession remember when people used to, used to whisper, human dimensions? <laughs> and, they, and the human dimensions people would be like, 
somewhere else. And then if a, a different face showed up, a black or brown or other person, they thought you were automatically in human dimensions. Because I used to get that. <laughs> I like, no, I'm an ornithologist. But now people are like, you're in human dimensions now, aren't you? Uh, but, you but, but we all are. The point is that we all are. And so, Bob, I think the, the expansion of our field is important. You know, we, we have sort of, again, pigeonholed ourselves into a place that people can easily sort of pillory us. And so and they can say, well, see, you're not a wildlife biologist or you're not a birder because you don't have the right binoculars or you don't go to the right places. You know, I think we have to stop discounting pigeons as non-birds um, and, and call them what they are. I mean, taxonomically, they're doves. And doves are what? Symbols of peace and freedom, right? I mean, what brought now, you know, I would argue that the raven that didn't come back with anything was kind of smart. Um, that dove that came back probably got eaten. Um, but in, in, in thinking about who we are, we have to expand who we are. So um, as, a, as an ornithologist, I talk a lot about personal, or what's your personal ornithology? Everybody has a bird story. Everybody has a bird, even if it's the chicken you ate last night. Everybody has a bird story. If it's the pigeon that decided that your car didn't need to be clean. If it's the starling, right, that you hear and you can't figure out what it is and it's a starling, that's an immigrant story. Starlings didn't ask to be here. But they're really smart and they will make you cry at a distance and as they swirl in murmuration. But you won't invite them to dinner. Why is that? You won't. You'll kill them off your feeder because they're not protected. I can tell stories all day long. I can tell immigrant stories all day long with birds. And if I never mention the bird's name, people are horrified. I can tell nativist stories about a great, again, ecological America all day long, and people will cringe. See where I'm going? We have to be circumspect about who we are, I think. Um, you know, again, I, all I, most of what I know is birding, and it, it, it horrified me going to the border and going to the wall and people being more concerned with whether or not they could count birds on one side of the wall or not versus what we literally saw in human suffering. That's bothersome. And I think when we do that, then we set ourselves against one another in ways that then say, okay, well, those are those people who only care about the birds, right? And then we can't get votes, and then we can't get support, and we wonder why we suffer, and we wonder why other people don't join us. And it's because we put ourselves in that hole. I, you know, I'm as guilty of as anybody. So, you know, and here's the test. How many of you are bird watchers or birders in here? Okay. Um, <laughs> try this. Walk into like a some strange room where there are other birders and walk in with like a pair of, I don't know, $50 binoculars around your neck, knockoffs, walk in, and if people don't know you, watch how they sort of, then put a pair of like, you know, high ends around your neck and watch how people pay attention to you. It's a neat test. It's a neat test. I've done it. I've been ignored with the knockoffs around my neck and if I put the others around my neck, so, you know, because people look, they're like, oh. <laughs> You're like, eyes here, right? <laughs> you need to pay attention to my binoculars. Not these, not these. So um, it, there's a lot going on in this field. And um, there's a lot good, but there's also sort of a lot that we've got installed in. And, I, you know, some of it I know how to approach, some of it I don't know how to approach. But, like I said, I'll have a long-winded response to any of it. <laughs> how many, about, before, and I want you to ask, how many undergrads are here? Oh, wow. All right. Grad students? Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Hi, Dr. Lanham. Um, it's great to finally get a chance to see you, hear you speak in person. Um, I often get discouraged within this field 
because I feel like the goals of conservation are often at odds with what you were talking about in your um, talk about love and care. And um, especially, you know, like thinking back to your example with the wind turbines and how someone always has to bear the cost um, of whatever decision that we make. And I don't know, a, a lot of times I just, I feel like it's game, game species versus non-game species. Wild, untouched spaces versus urban spaces. And, nev and, and then when you, being a, a black woman who grew up in an urban space and then going down to the rural south to learn about conservation, I often felt like those urban spaces were villainized mm. and the people who lived within those spaces were also villainized and that we were not welcomed as a part of the conversation or if we were just kind of seen as like a, a trouble or those people just need to move or relocate or they're dumb or this or that. And so I'm just kind of wondering if you can share a little bit more about how we begin to incorporate a little bit more of that love and care during a time where we are seeing that is it's very apparent that people don't have any love and care. Like there's so much just like hate going on around right now. And when you even see like within the field where it's the game, the people who study game species versus non-game species and trying to get them to care about the non-game species or getting people to care about, you know, green spaces within non-wild spaces. Like how do we begin to kind of start having those conversations and shifting from this traditional mindset to a more like love, care, inclusive mindset? Thank you for that question. Your name? Deja Perkins. De D thank you, Deja. I, you know, it's, um, and, and I say that, that, that's a great question. It's a very hard question because you know, it's easy to throw out there, and you hear it frequently, not in this field, it's easy to hear people say love and care, right? But if you think about how difficult that actually is, um, it, it is more difficult than, than, than any analysis or data collection um, you will, scientific data collection you will ever, ever do. And so I spend a lot of time, Deja, really trying to go at people in a way um, for them to understand, first of all, to, to do this, right? What, is this, what does this mean? What does this mean? If I come to you, palms up. It, it means here's my agenda. My hands are open. I'm unarmed, right? So, um, and, and, and so for people, and I'm up front with them. I tell them what I'm going to tell them, right? I, I don't, I, I don't want to hide behind my agenda but I also want you to understand who it is that I am. And so I believe fully in personal story. Um, I, I, I believe in a sort of guerrilla warfare. I don't believe in broad front. I don't believe that I'm gonna come, be able to come and sprinkle uh, love and pixie care dust over everyone and, and suddenly people do that. Um, but meeting people, knowing people, right? I mean, I didn't know Brad from I mean, when he came to Clemson, right? And we had a lot of differences in terms of where we were from and maybe what, but, but we found these commonalities one-on-one -on -one that have persevered, have endured over what, two decades? A long time, a long time. So um, that's one of the things, and, and that sounds simplistic again, but one of the, the things that I would encourage um, within departments, you know, to, to give students, conservation is still, we, we still sort of hide behind the critters. And so to give within a department or a unit opportunities for voice of, of, of not just the research you do, the critters you love. You know, I would love if someone would say, you know, can you, can you tell us why you do what you do? When's the last time anybody asked any of you that? Right. They just, they just want to see your numbers. And no one knows your origin. Think about that. It's like you were just dropped and just parachuted into a place without purpose. 
your purpose is not really the degree. Did you know that? <laughs> it really isn't. It's so that you have some choice in exercising your passion. That's what it is. And by being in a place like that, you immediately have a commonality, Deja. Um, and so, you know, I want to give voice to people. Um, not, no, I'm not, I don't want to give voice. Step back and let people voice themselves in the way that they voice themselves. I'll, I'll tell you, I, I know during, and you know this, um, I remember during the, that first Black Birders Week, you know, all the people at all the bird clubs that shut down, that didn't want us to have anything to do with the movement that you started, right? And so what do you do about that? What do you do about that? Well, part of what you have to do is when you have the opportunity, you have to speak truth to that. You have to speak truth to that. And part of what we have tended to do in conservation as we've said, well, it's really not about that. Bob's question says that it is, <laughs> right? His question says that it is. He's asking the question. So during that, as, as that movement has gone on, you know, you've seen the people who are willing to listen and maybe sometimes be uncomfortable in the stories of others and to listen. If you find somebody willing to listen to you, to sit and actually listen to your story, that's the beginning of something special. That's the beginning of something special. So, you know, that's sort of why, and, and, and the reason that I, that I said that about, that I said what I said about Chris in part is, you know, um, You're trying to give me a raise. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. You know, you, you, you come across all kinds of people in school, um, some kind, some not, and you learn who people are, right? And you, and you watch them over time and how they go through life. Um, and, 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 and that is something that, you know, during a very pivotal time in my life when um, Chris just didn't walk away or become someone who I did not want to have any association with. That, that's, that's truth. So again, I think from, you know, I tell, you know, when I have a chance to talk to agencies or conservation groups, you'll hear me say um, one of the ways that you can get better is to blow up your boards. Blow up your board. If you want a fiduciary board, have one, call it that. But then have an advisory board that's very, that advisory board is not dependent on the money that I can pull out of my pocket to give you for power. Right? And so in that way, Deja, then you also begin to develop a very different essence. If you ask conservation organizations, groups, not just about name change, but what does your mission mean? It's easy to change a name. It really is. Now, there's, yeah, well, they, you know, I'm glad they don't. I'm, I'm, I'm glad, you know, I want to hear the discussions about those things, mind you. Um, but I also want to see substantive change. And, and, if, and, if, and if someone, I mean, it's no different than that interpersonal relationship I'm talking about, Deja. So, you know, I think we, we have a long way to go because we've been insular as conservationists and we've been able to hide behind the birds or the beasts and say it's really about them, not about us. When um, all it takes is really paying attention to what, <laughs> you know, a lot of people have said, but one of my favorites is Leopold and thinking about our part in nature and you know, he, he, he talked about, I'm paraphrasing here, he said, you know, you know, he has two f favorite things, you know, people's relationship to land, but people's relationship to people. And, and, and so that's where conservation really begins. Because guess what? I can tell you, being one of the wildest places, at least in North America, a very wild place at least, when the, when the pandemic came and the roads closed down and the humans left, man, the critters in Denali, they were like, yay, this is ours. This is ours. We're taking it back. And it took, it was like that. It was quick, fast, and in a hurry. Um, now, the human element takes a lot longer. Um, I said today with the grad students, I asked how many people, okay, I'm going to admit, I am INFP. Okay, right? 
INFP. That's why many of us got into this business. For many of us, that means what? What is INFP? Right, no. I'm not for people. <laughs> and that's a problem. That's why many of us got into this, because we wanted to be away from people. And that's our excuse for not treating others better. So I think agencies from universities, um, all agencies at every level and people need to, need to get back into thinking about our part and, and the part that we play as fellow Earth travelers. And that all sounds really sort of mushy, but uh, I have been at some of these tables where people have done some of this hard work and I have watched people do everything from become very angry to leave the boards, to cry, to be fired, to being fired. Um, and it's just, it's a lot of work. And it's harder work than the habitat or critter work that you do, I guarantee it. It's hard, it's really, really hard. Because the, you, you watch the bird, the bird does what the bird does. Maybe, um, I don't know, if it's a harpy eagle and you climb the nest, you got some issues. It's gonna come at you, um, or the goss, but by and large, you know, the critters are going to let you alone. People aren't. And they're going to come at you in ways. And so I think one of the measures for what we're doing as organizations is if we're getting pushback, keep pushing back. If you're not getting pushback, you need to check yourself. Okay? Does that make sense? The, the, the easy, the path of least resistance is a thing. I get it. But in conservation right now, we can't afford to take path of least resistance. Thank you. Thank you. I have a question here, and we'll come back up. Please. Hi, Dr. Lanham. Wonderful talk. Could you Thank tell you. us about that art exhibit you have downtown? Oh, the art exhibit downtown. Um, I think it's still there um, in the Audubon Gallery. I've, I've been having uh, conversations with John James Audubon for a few years. Um, not because I hate Johnny, uh, but, but mostly as sort of an illumination. Um, and and most, most folks, you know, I talk about, and it's, it used to be about identity, because you go into New Orleans, and you go into New Orleans, and one thing about Louisiana, New Orleans in particular, and, and the associated parishes, is that, that there, was a, there was a very distinct ideas about identity and race. So for example, mulatto, <laughs> quadroon, octoroon. You guys ever heard of that? Okay. So um, you go into um, the, the Museum of uh, African American History in New Orleans and Audubon hangs there. Well, why is that? Somebody knows something, right? Now people say, well, he just claimed. They're just claiming him. Well. You know, this whole idea, and, and biographers disagree. Most biographers say, well, there's no issue, but they, his mother was a Haitian Creole chambermaid. What does that mean? Now, does it matter? It doesn't matter to me when Audubon, in his own words, in, in his ornithological biographies, well, first of all, he owned enslaved, he enslaved people, but then in his, his biographies, he wrote the story of the runaway. How many people have read that? How many people have read Audubon's biographies? his ornithological biographies. So he's in the swamp, he's in the bayou, and um, he comes across uh, this man who's self-liberated, this black man who's self-liberated. Some would say escaped, I say self-liberated. Uh, and this, he's hungry, Audubon is hungry. I think Audubon had, I think he'd shot a couple of ibis, I think. Um, but anyway, he's telling the story about how nice this, at first how afraid he was of this black man in the woods, of course, that's a story there. Um, but then how nice this man was to him and how the man had worked also to liberate his family. And you know, he ate and he talked about the children 
What did Audubon do the next morning to, as he was going to continue on his birding expedition? What did Audubon do? Yes. He re-enslaved them. <laughs> I didn't write those words. John James Audubon wrote those words. And people said, well, he was an exaggerator. Well, what, would you really, really? <laughs> do you want to stand on that? So that exhibit is there, Melissa, in part. Um, to tell those stories, to use Audubon's words. I sort of Mirandize Audubon um, in, in, in that I don't take anything out of, I mean, Audubon wrote it. How many people knew, how many, how many of you know who John James Audubon was? All right, how did he paint the birds? He, he saw them and painted them, plain air, right? Every last one shot, and he just shoot one bird he would decide he would get sort of this bloodlust, and he, he found chimney swifts. He found chimney swifts roosting in this huge cavernous hollow, which even in his time was becoming rare, right? So Audubon spent a couple of days like going at the base of this, this tree, this snag, and finally got entry into it. And when he got entry into it, he took how many birds? Over 100. How many do you need to paint? I mean, and I say that, okay, so hearing people say, well, you're a hunter, right? Um, you know, and, and so I try to make, with, the, with the, the art exhibit, no, I didn't paint anything. Um, but what I've done is I've taken um, sort of, I've, I've taken Audubon's art and um, there are extra notations there. So the North Carolina Museum of Art has done uh, Lauren um, Applebaum um, is who has really helped lead that effort. I think it's still up, but I've had a chance to do that with the Scottish Museum, with North Carolina Museum of Art, with the Charleston Museum, um, and, um, and with a couple of others. So that should still be there. So Johnny, Johnny Jim and I are gonna keep talking. And, um, and last thing. People say, and this is what I'll send you on your way with, people will say, leave John James Audubon alone. He was a man of his time. And he was. Who was a contemporary naturalist? Henry David Thoreau. You know what Thoreau was doing as Walden was going to press? He was pissed off because of the Fugitive Slave Act. Don't read Walden. It bores the hell out of most students. Read Civil Disobedience. Most, most conservation slash environmental organizations don't even know that civil disobedience exists. Here is a naturalist. I mean, how many of you know who Henry David Thoreau was? Right? Environmental hero, right? Shied away from social issues, right? No, not at all. So I think when people want to equivocate and say, well, that was history, he was a man of his time. Well, Henry David Thoreau was a contemporary who is in many ways the opposite, not perfect. I don't paint any person as perfect. Thoreau had his own issues. I have my own issues. Um, but I, I think it's important for us historically to grab hold of people like that, to grab hold of people like that and say, well, yeah, but you did it another way and you're no less known for what you did. Maybe you didn't paint birds, but you use words that we still, still stand by today. So in those ways, I think, is Deja's question, person by person. Person by person is the way to go. And if we, we do that, it's like bird by bird. You know, I don't discount any cardinal, because that's my grandmama's red bird, right? I ask her permission before I give an owl hoot. <coughs> Because for her and her ornithology, that was forbidden. So I asked her just a little moment of permission, right? And, um, and it's better. So thank you all for everything. Thank you for being here. Thank you for your questions. Does anybody have, was there one more question? One more question. Yeah, sure, I'll love to take it. Okay. Uh, hi, Dr. Lanham. Uh, my name is Ben Zeno. I'm a first year master's student here at State uh, studying fisheries, wildlife, and conservation biology. And I'm interested to hear um, if you ever had a specific moment that you can remember 
where you stopped to look at the commas? Like, what, what was oh. that moment for you? Oh, my gosh. Um, honest, uh, so, Benzino, is it? Most recently, unexpectedly, I mean, post-breeding uh, dispersal, swallowtail kites do some serious wandering. And it's just a bird that I, you know, and in the upstate of South Carolina, they're, they're not so uncommon anymore, but I, you know, a swallowtail kite is, is a god that deserves worship. So um, I was headed towards this, uh, I mean, not a very wild place one day, and I look up, and, and there are a couple of Mickeys, uh, Mississippi kites, a um, couple of Mi Mississippi kites, which, I mean, they're just wonderful flyers, right? So I'm looking, and then all of a sudden, here across the road is Tulane, comes a swallowtail kite in Oconee County. And I had to pull over. You know where I pulled over to watch that bird? In the Dollar General parking lot. <laughs> Which says something, right? I mean, there's a sociological phenomenon there, but here I am, and I, you know, and I, and I had my phone, and so I'm taking these, this, this little you know, video, and I'm like, man, I can't get the big, I can't get the Dollar General in there, and the bird swoops right down, right? <laughs> wild and free. No matter where that bird is, it's wild and free, and it stopped me. It stopped me. Um, that a swallowtail kite gets on the wind, and a couple of hundred miles to a swallowtail kite is like a blink. It's like a couple of flaps. I think swallowtail kites probably compete with one another to see who can flap less. I, I mean, but, you know, um, Tess did, she has the earrings on. So if you don't know what a swallowtail kite is, find Tess and look at her earrings. <laughs> but that's the last, I mean, that, that's, that just stopped. And then the other day it was, a, you know, some Swainson's thrushes coming through. Um, and I'm thinking, where'd those birds come from? And suddenly they're in my yard. I mean, I heard, you know, I've heard them in the subarctic, but they're in my yard. They're in my, and where are they going? They're going to be in a couple, few days, they're going to be in the company of Jaguar. When you think about that, you're like, you see something like that, right? But then it's like frog, froglets, right? Um, little cricket frogs that are the size of your thumbnail. Just little perfect little beings. You know, and it hops up on your thumbnail for a minute, and you're like, you know, that's, that's everything. So um, hopefully those, those, those moments, what was yours? Have you had one? Yeah. How'd it make you feel? <laughs> Good. That's that, you know, that's what, that's what we all are. You know, I think if, if we see ourselves that way, um, if, if we sort of humble ourselves in that way um, with these other beings, then um, it makes us better, makes them better too. So thank you. Thank you. I got one second. Well, yeah, we want to say thank you so much from NC State and the College of Natural Resources. So we got you. There's not a tractor in there, but it's, oh. uh, I know you were looking <laughs> for a tractor. But thank it, you. It, um, thank you very much. No, thank you so much for interacting with our students and spending time on campus. I know it means so much to so many people. So we really shared that, enjoyed the, sh the shared time with you. Um, I do want to say, too, there is going to be a reception afterwards for a little bit. So there's drinks, I think cookies back there. Um, I also wanted to say, I think there's the QR code back there. Um, so you can scan that and actually purchase a few of Dr. Lanham's books if you're interested. Um, and on the, I don't know where Lauren is, are there any more of your, are the, are the magazines? <laughs> you're not paying attention. <laughs> the, they, the Coast Watch magazines, are they still out in the front? They, they have, they have okay, yeah, so there's a few magazines and these are fantastic because it shares, uh, I think it's a whole interview with Lauren and um, Dr. Lanham as well. So those are free to take if they're not, outside, they maybe have been moved inside. But, but again, let's thank Dr. Lanham for coming and, and spending time with us. Thank you so much. Yeah.